do want to share something with you that I have not shared a lot in the past. And, I, you know, uh, it's taken me 20 years to figure out how to pastor a church. And I think 20 more years I'm going to figure this thing out. Uh, we have a lot of family members that go through uh, rehabilitation sometimes. They get, uh, get themselves in a, in a mess and they have to come out on the other side. And one of the things that we do as a church, which is very detrimental to them, which I have found out because I've had individual conversations with these, with these folks, the worst thing that we can do is overpraise them for what they have done. Uh, I, I have known, and this is no lie, I have had at least five individuals, listen, to five, in, in the years that I've been here, five individuals who have given their testimony at their home church where they came from, and on the night that they gave their testimonies, they collapsed, re, uh, slipped back up, and went back into what they had just come out from the rehab from doing. And the reason for that is, is, is because you love them so much. Because what you do is, the first thing you look at them and you say, I am so proud of you. And then what happens in their mind, that, that, their mind's not working like yours is. Their mind is, you're going to cease to be proud of me if I slip up. And then I'm going to be in worse shape than I was before. So I just want to share with you the proper thing to say when someone is coming out of a, a rehab and they're doing really good is say, I am really praying for you. I just want you to know that God loves you and I love you very much at the same time. So be sure and share with them in that way, okay? And I think that will be a major influence to help them along where they're going. So thank you for letting me share that. If you would, go ahead and take your Bible out and turn to the book of Proverbs. And we're going to be in chapter 19 tonight. And uh, instead of reading the whole chapter 19, I'm going to dive in and just pick up with three verses right there. And we'll go back and pick up a couple of verses along the way. But in chapter 19, verses 21 through 23, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna read those verses. So Proverbs chapter 19, uh, verses 21 through 23, contained in here is the whole of why you were here. Does anybody remember who the Old Testament says is the wisest man that ever lived? It is Solomon, all right? And does anybody remember what his conclusion was in the last chapter of that book? All right, I sum everything up, and in the end he came, fear God and keep his commandments. In chapter 19 right here, we find that very same thing. Well, we, we'll find that out right here. It says in uh, verses uh, 21, it says, many are the plans in the mind of, of a man. Now, remember, men, retinue men, could be women too. So many are the plans in our minds. But it is the purpose of the Lord that will do what? It's going to stand. The purpose of the Lord is going to be what works out. Okay? What is desired in a man is steadfast love. And a poor man is better than a liar. Then look at verse 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. And whoever has it rest satisfied, he will not be visited by harm. And all God's people said. Amen. Okay, so some great information in that we need to take and process. Uh, tonight, what I want you to walk away from chapter 19 with this is this. Uh, by knowing God, by knowing, the, the greater you can know God, the better off you're going to be. But by knowing God and living a life of wisdom, one will avoid poverty, you will avoid anger, and as you, you will discover the good that God has for you in your very own life, if you'll avoid those things. Now, God has a purpose for mankind. Everybody say this if you would. God has a purpose for me. God absolutely has a purpose for you, and he has a purpose for me in my life. All things will work together to bring the purposes to fulfillment. Your job as a believer is to know God to the fullest, most possible extent. The better you can know God, the more you can understand who He is, the better He's going to reveal His purpose in your life. And when He reveals His purpose in your life, you're going to find the things that you want, that'll actually make you happy that you're going to do in your life. Your job as a believer is to know God to the fullest, most possible extent, then to act upon that which you know in a way that shows that you love Him and that your understanding 
of him has led you to the purpose that he has in your life. And that's what this, this chapter is teaching us. Now, a couple of quick reminders. Uh, one reminder is this. Remember that Proverbs are not absolute truths. Proverbs are the way things work in God's economy and the way things work uh, when people yield to and listen to the Word of God. Now that I say that, I want you to look for just a second, and I want to show you how this works. I want you to look for just a second at verse 10. Look at verse 10 real quick. All right? Verse 10 reads this way. It says, It is not fitting for a fool to live in luxury, and then look at the second half of the verse right here. It's not fitting for a fool to live in luxury, much less for a slave to rule over princes. Okay? So according to that text right there, a slave should never have authority over a prince. If that was an absolute truth, then God's word could never, uh, never override that absolute truth because it's an absolute truth. Can you think of any slave in the Old Testament who became the advisor and the ruler over the princes? Joseph. Because he was a slave, yet God put him in a position of prince. Was that God's will? It was God's plan from the very beginning to do that. Now, let's understand that Proverbs, we need to listen to Proverbs. We need to live according to the Proverbs because they're the rules that God has, has for us. But just always understand that we've got to filter them through the entire word of God to be able to understand that. So I want you to be able to see that in that verse. Now, the, the first major truth I want you to take home with you tonight is this. Knowing, uh, no, excuse me, knowledge of God and yielding to his purpose is the whole duty of an individual. If you do not get those two things, you have missed what your purpose in the world is. You got to know who God is and you got to yield to His, to what it is that He's created you to do. Now, ultimately, He has created you to glorify Him, but in order to glorify Him, you got to know Him. And in order for you to know Him, you got to know what the Bible has to say. So, without knowing what the Bible has to say, you, can't, you won't be able to do that. But when you know what the Bible has to say and you begin to understand God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, he begins to unlock that on the inside of you so that you can see and know who he is. And we saw that in verses 21 through 23. Now, uh, here, here's, an, here's another thing that we pick up from this chapter right here. I didn't, I, I didn't get an overhead. I put this on the overhead, but I do want to go ahead and mention it because we see it in verses 4 through 8. Many poor people. Now, notice I did not say every poor person. I did not say every poor person. I said many poor people. Because if you remember, Jesus said, you will always have the poor among you. Okay, so there's always going to be some folks. And, and this, this is one of those things where it's not absolute that every person is poor. Sometimes circumstances happen that God allows people to be poor for his glory. Okay, uh, But listen to this. Uh, many people are poor because they are, number one, unlearned. Number two, they have poor people skills. And number three, they're selfish. And number four, it might be because they're lazy. Okay, All right, Now, where do I pull that from? Listen to verses 4 through 8. Or you can look at more 4 through 8 real quick if you want to. Wealth brings many friends. Now, do y'all believe that? Rich people got lots of friends. Why they got lots of friends? Because they got plenty of money and everybody wants to run to it. Doesn't make it right. It's just the way that it is. Wealth brings many friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friends. Now, why, does this, why do his friends desert him? Because they got nothing they're going to get out of. Okay? That's the nature of man. I'm not saying that's the way it ought to be. The proverb is saying this is how it is. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will not escape. Many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. Now, why is he a friend to the man who gives gifts? Because he thinks he might get one of the gifts. That's right. That's right. Okay. All a poor man's brothers hate him. How much more do his friends go afar from him? He pursues them with words, but does not have them. Whoever gets sense loses his own soul, but he who seeks understanding will discover good. Now, unfortunately, in this world, a lot of times the rich people are the ones who have all people around them because people want to get in on what the stuff that they have. But now on the flip side of that is, a lot of times the reason the people are poor is because they've been able to, unable to communicate what they know. 
They've been able to communicate with other people in, in a way. If you skip down to verses, uh, uh, verse 24, you look down at verse 24 and verse 25. We're gonna, no, excuse me, we're going to look at verse 15 and then verse 24. It says, slothfulness, slothfulness cast into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. Because they don't get anything done, they're going to go hungry because they don't get anything done. The sluggard buries his head in the dish and he will not even bring it back up to his mouth because he's so lazy he won't pick up the food to put it into his own mouth. Okay, uh, next truth I want us to see from the scriptures is this. Desire. Okay, uh, maybe, maybe I want to say it this way, zeal. You know, you ever, know, you ever, know, you ever know, some people can just really get fired up sometimes about something and they just really, really want to make sure that something happens. Desire or zeal without knowledge and wisdom leads to a gross misunderstanding of God's way. Let me ask you this question. Is it possible for you to be zealous in desire to prove a text in the Bible that you have misinterpreted yourself but you still but you believe with your heart it's absolutely true. Yes, you can. You can. So when you have a zeal for something that is not based on truth, you, you're going to find out in the end that what you're trying to accomplish is not going to come accomplished because it's going to come tumbling down because it's not based on the truth that's in the Word. That's why we have to know the Word so much. Proverbs uh, 19, 2 and 3 says, Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses the way. When a man's folly brings him to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. So somebody could have so much zeal and be so convinced that God said this is what needs to be done that when it doesn't happen, they get mad at God because God didn't do what God said God was going to do. Okay. God gets an awful lot of credit for things that he never did. All right. Because people, you know, uh, you know, uh, God will say, well, somebody will say, well, God uh, caused me to win, win God, you know, God caused me to win the lottery. Or God told me I needed, to, I needed to abandon his word for this thing over here so I could benefit from that because after all, God wants me. No matter how zealous you are, no matter how hard you believe that, it's not God that does that. It could be us that's doing that ourselves. So desire can get wiped out by all of that. Fifth thing I think we learned from our text tonight is this. Withholding discipline from a child will result in the early death of a child. <laughs> withholding, withholding discipline from a child will result in the early death of a child. Uh, verses 18 and 19. Verse 18 specifically it says, Discipline your son for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Now, what does it mean by that? Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Does that mean that you're going to kill your child? No, it's not talking about you killing your child. It's talking about your child being so out of control that y'all have felt like killing your child. Okay, everybody here has ever felt like killing one of their children? Raise their hand. Let's just get that over, okay? We don't, but we feel like it from time to time. Okay, but that's not what that text is talking about. That text is talking about when the discipline is withheld from them, in the end, they will make decisions and choose things that will wind up destroying them from themselves. A man of great wealth, it says in verses 19 and 20, a man of great, of great wrath will pay the penalty, for if you deliver him, you'll only have to do it again. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may, may gain wisdom in the future. That you may gain wisdom in the future. And it also says in verses 25 and 20, 29, uh, strike a scoffer and the simple will learn prudence. Remove a man from understanding and he will gain knowledge. He who does violence to his father and chases away his mother is a son who brings shame and reproach. Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will stay from the words of knowledge. A worthless, a, a worthless witness mocks a justice and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. Condemnation is ready for scoffers and beating for the backs of the fool. The reason a parent disciplines their children is so that the, a parent can discipline themselves out of a job. Did y'all see that? The reason you discipline your children is so that you can discipline yourself out of a job. What do I mean by that? 
Okay, if you've done a good job with discipline, by the time they get old, they don't need you to discipline anymore because they've developed personal discipline and now they're ready to go off and have children who can discipline, they can discipline those children. The purpose of discipline is not because your children embarrassed you, right? You think a child's ever got a whipping because they embarrassed their mama or daddy? That's it. They have, and I probably in my own, discipline my own children as a young man in that same thing, but that's absolutely wrong for us to do that. The reason we discipline children is not so we can inflict pain on them because we're angry with them, but the reason we inflict discipline on them is so that they will learn to take up the mantle of discipline themselves and discipline themselves to become who God wants them to be and fulfill the purpose that God has for them in their lives. And then the sixth thing, and I, I hope you'll understand this right here. You, you can... Okay. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Is that make the child? I know it makes it worse. I know that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is, is that that same thing? Do I want to help them get clean, or is it going to give it? No, no. Let let me say something. Yeah. Let let me let me let me say something here that your children, when they rebel against God and they do the wrong thing. That's not your fault. You may could have done a better job in any given situation, but who made the decision to rebel against God? Your child did. Okay. I, right. Okay. So, no, but now God created you and your husband differently. Nine out of ten times, not all the time, but nine out of ten times, or eight out of ten times, the man is going to have a tendency to go overboard. And, and, and discipline with too strong of a discipline. And eight out of ten times a woman over here is going to discipline too softly. I'm not saying every time, but I'm going to say that's, that's going to happen a lot of the time. So why is that? Well, that's why God puts one man and one woman together so that the woman can say to the man, have you lost your ever-loving mind? Uh, and then the, the husband can say to the wife, well, you just let them get away with anything. And then, of course, you, then you have your own little bicker. Anyway, you work through this thing. So you wind up, instead of with an iron fist or with a feather tickle me, you wind up somewhere in the middle with that so that you wind up making the right decision on that. So that's why God chose to put that thing together that way. Now, having said that, families are going to be plagued with foolish individuals. How many people in here have a child that's ever done a stupid thing? Okay. Did they get that from their mama or their daddy? <laughs> yeah, I was expecting an even kill on that. I didn't get that. All I heard was daddy out of every one of that. Every single one of us in here have done stupid things along the way. Just We're just the nature of what we are. We do selfish things. A foolish son is ruined to his father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. I like the, uh, 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 the green, what was the old green Bible, the living Bible? It says a wife is like a leaky faucet. Yeah. I, but, but the nagging wife is like a leaky faucet. Okay. I, it says, uh, he who does violence to his father and chases away his mother is a son who brings shame and reproach. Um, unfortunately, you as a parent can do everything right. And you still have a child who raises up and rebels against God. And you as a parent can do everything wrong. And there'll be a child that raises up and follows God and does the right thing. Now, statistical probabilities, the more you do right, the more understanding your child will have when it comes to those decisions. But it's them that's going to make that decision. And... If I ask everybody, and well, let me just go ahead and ask, how many people have at least one crazy person in their family, in your total extended family? Okay, you got you got more than one. Oh, you're the crazy one. Okay, all right. <laughs> you, usually, the crazy one doesn't know they're the crazy one. Okay, I. Right. You know, everybody's got that weird uncle or that wild child. You know, there, there's just, every family. No matter how good you are at being a daddy and a mama, so there's just going to be some individuals that are just going to do what they do. 
And what do you do? You pray like crazy. And you cry out to God and you do everything that you can do. The pursuit of godly wisdom and its application in your life is the very part of God's purpose that he wants you most to find out. That is why you not only read your Bible every day, but you try to figure out why those words are in there and what that has to do with you. Because the better you know who God the Father is, the better you understand who Jesus is, the better you understand who the Holy Spirit is and how they work in situations, the better you're going to be able to help the next generation come up and be who they're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. Does that mean they won't have problems and they'll get it right? If you got everything right when you were 20, does that mean they'll turn out to be perfect? No, it doesn't. It just means you better understand God, you better understand what God is doing later on in their lives. Um, you got to know God if you're gonna want to, if you're gonna know what His purpose for your life is. So seek to know God. And some of people's God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's.